<laughs> and welcome once again to the Liberty Lounge podcast. I am Johnny B. Y'all know me from YouTube. On my left is Jared of Guns and Gadgets. You guys, the audience, have let us know repeatedly that Jared's laptop is lacking in stickers. I tell you who is not lacking in any way is Anthony, the arm scholar out in California. He's waving as well. Jared, I've had joke. a busy week. I have seen the headlines. What the heck? Walk me through this. What the heck is going on with the ATF and this new ruling? Uh, man, I, we don't. <laughs> how long you want to go? Um, so I guess we'll go down the, the, the down and dirty part of it is... Uh, in 2022, a couple dozen rhinos, uh, which are Republicans in name only, got uh, a bill passed through both chambers of Congress, the Congress, you know, the House and, and the Senate, and Joe Biden passed it. That was called the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. And the big part of that was, uh, you know, they were going to fix mental health issues by bribing states to start their own red flag laws. And buried in that were a lot of uh, changes to some definitions that would assist the ATF in figuring out what a, a firearm dealer really is. Because, you know, almost 250 years later, we still, I guess, need another definition change of what a firearm dealer is. Uh, so that passed and Merrick Garland and the ATF uh, started to salivate and they put out a notice of proposed rulemaking and that rule dropped yesterday. The long and the short of it is, it changes what a firearm dealer is. They really want to stop all of the gun sales at gun shows. The gun show loophole. Yeah, loophole. yeah. But because of so many gray areas and catch-alls that are in this rule, it affects you and me. If I sell one gun and make a profit, a penny, then I could be liable for, you know, or I could be responsible for selling a gun as when I'm not being an FFL, not having a federal license. If I offer a gun for sale, but don't sell it, I could still be violating this rule. If my my gun group or my range has a gun they want to raffle off to raise money to sue the ATF, and they're not an FFL, they could be liable. There's so many ways to get jammed up. It's not good at all. It's one of the worst rules. Now, of all the rules the ATF does, not a single one of them is good, but this one is really bad. This will affect tens of millions of Americans as soon as it goes into the registry. Uh, the federal registry has to put, uh, post it. It'll probably be done early next week, mid next week, and then it goes live 30 days from there. But it's it's no bueno at all. Do you think anything's going to happen like where we do those? What's it called, Anthony, when we get to make comments as the public? Is it going to go through one of those it's, situations? It's already happened. So this is the final rule. The notice of, pro notice of proposed rulemaking, which is part of the you know APA process that the ATF has to go through when they're changing rules or changing regulations, that's already happened. So this is the final rule. It will get, like Jared said, probably posted here within the next week, and then it goes active 30 days. It's effective. Now, FBC and all the other GOA, all these orgs are already posturing, you know, saying that they're going to they're gonna sue the ATF. We're going to see the same thing happen that we, we see with the pistol braces and the vendor stock frames and receivers rule cases, all of those the same process will happen. But one of the things I want to go back to, which is interesting, a lot of people overlook the whole bipartisan safer communities act. That was a direct response to Uvalde. Nothing in that rule in, in that statute that was passed in that law that was passed, including this here would have prevented any of those incidents, any of them. And so it's, it's funny at the time, I know me and Jared, we've talked about this a lot. When the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act was being pushed right after Uvalde, myself, Jared, and a lot of other commentators were saying, we cannot let this pass. Do not do a bipartisan rule. None of this stuff is going to impact what we just saw anyways. And any, any gray area you give the ATF, they will take a mile. And I saw a lot of comments in, on my videos, eh, it's not that big of a deal because initially they were going to try to do a lot of stuff with uh, domestic violence. And there was thoughts about what actually they were going to include in there. They thought maybe they were actually going to try to go after like magazines and, and other things. A lot of that language ended up getting stripped out, but it was still a bad rule. And we pointed to this redefinition of who is engaged in the business of dealing firearms and how they're redefining language. And we postulated at that time that, Hey, maybe they're going to go after private party sales. And that's exactly what they did. No less than a year later, the ATF is now redefining, you know, changing regulatory. Well, I mean, they didn't redefine what ended up happening is the Bipartisan Safety Communities Act itself redefined what is engaged in the business. Now you have this new regulation 
expanding on that, given the ATF's interpretation of that redefinition. And a lot of this, like Jared said, it's all intent-based. It's all the ATF reaching in, trying to reach within your mind, determine who has the intent to sell firearms for a profit, therefore they need to be licensed and regulated. And oh, by the way, along with that, not only comes like a civil administrative procedure that the ATF can go after you for, there are criminal implications for you selling firearms outside of having the FFL license. Now, the ATF in this rule, which is about 466 pages, multiple times tries to say, the process that we are outlining here is not touching directly on how a criminal court should interpret these things, but they can use our guidelines to determine whether or not you are criminally culpable for whatever activity. So it's a mess. I mean, we can go through the six factor presumptions that the ATF outlines, which are six factors that they come up with, but then they also love those catch all phrases of, this is not an exhaustive list. We can come up with more. We can do whatever we want to say that you're engaged in the business of dealing firearms in violation of federal law. So that's just my, again, ramble on and frustration with this. And I have it pulled up and I've been kind of chopping through it the last couple of days trying to weed through this nonsense, but it's it's a mess. It also affects, and I hope they're listening, all of our friends that are in the YouTube firearms community, it affects every one of you. Some of our friends are FFLs, but the ones who aren't, you're a sole proprietor. You are specifically named in this rule. If you ever try to turn or flip one of those, it, it goes after FFLs who Joe Biden's been putting out of business at a rate 400% higher than his predecessors. Uh, it now addresses how they can get rid of their inventory. And if it wasn't transferred to a private collection of the owner for a calendar year, then they are also tripped up in this as well. It's just, it's horrible. There's nothing good about it. ATF can't make law. Let's put that out there because right now we got people that are like, ATF can't make law. We know that. Uh, it's a rule. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a federal rule. rule. It's not a law. It has the effect to put you in prison. So it's still a law. And the ATF only exists to infringe on a constitutionally guaranteed right, the only right that says shall not be infringed. So their job is to try to make our lives miserable, and they just keep doing that. And it's just going to keep happening until we get somebody to stand up. You know, I think most most folks that are listening, they're not in the position that the three of us are in where we eat and breathe this stuff. A lot of folks, like, they have to, like, go to work in the morning, and they're not delving through six stages of the levels of hell that Anthony is as he's parsing through a 400 page document. What does this really mean for the, for the regular average Joe that's got six or eight guns and he and his brother, they swap guns once a year. What does this mean for the average regular guy? Uh, the big part is, is if you want to sell a gun, uh, they prefer you to go through an FFL for that transaction. That's what they want. They, but they want to do background checks on everybody. They want to know who has what. They want expanded background checks in a registry. The ATF, every 4473, GOA has proven this. They've got this uh, undercover with a FOIA request. They have over a billion transactions that are in a searchable database. It's all the 4473s are scanned in. So that's what they want. They want to know what you have. So please fill out a 4473 so we can scan it in. How about we talk really good about the ATF for a minute? This is bizarre. I cannot believe I'm about to say something positive about the AFT and their dog slaying tactics. Jared, good news on the forms and the speed of the forms. What is going on with that? Well, I don't want to give them credit for anything um, because it's what we have <laughs> this to hurts, do. Doesn't it? it does. It hurts it's a little bit. It's a violation of our rights to even have to do this. So I bought a suppressor and right now the Form 4s are coming back at a very increased rate than they ever have before. Historically, about a year? Uh, it's shorter than that, actually. Uh, when Last time that they went offline, about two months ago, that's when these insane turnaround times have been reported. The fastest I have seen was like 48 hours. Um, I got mine back in one shift, one eight-hour shift. It was approved. 
uh, which was insane. The FFL said it was I was the fastest he's ever seen. Uh, and people out there trying to say, how do I get on that train? Some key things is I, mine went through silencer shop. I already had fingerprints and a, a picture on file. Uh, they used the, uh, the kiosk, the silencer shop kiosk. So everything was as, you know, smooth and fast as it could possibly be. It's already approved. Um, at least that process is with ATF. So it's basically, they just hit send. Uh, so that's how I got mine, uh, fast. I did try to test it again. I, we bought another one last night to try to test it for the, for the FFL. Um, so it, I got my thing certified at 8.50 p.m. We'll see what happens. You went and got another suppressor just to see what would happen. Uh, yeah, it's called research. No, it's called privilege, ladies and gentlemen. This is a man <laughs> of great privilege. <laughs> Anthony, let me ask you this, because like, a lot of folks, uh, regular, regular average shows don't get to play with the pow pals and the shoot shoots that we get to. Are suppressors as awesome as they seem to be? Does the regular average Joe need to jump into this? So, I mean, I have a different perspective because obviously I'm in California and we have NFA restrictions here. But we you're going to shoot them at at, at, at a, I do. At so so that, that's, that's why I have a different perspective because it, they're unobtainium to me. So anytime I get to go to um, any of these events, any of these expos, and we get to shoot with suppressors or full auto suppressed, it's amazing. I, I think you should have access to whatever you want. I mean, keep in mind the federal government regulates these items as firearms within their own right. That's why we're going through this whole NFA process. Um, yeah, they're they're awesome. I think if you're in another state and you can own suppressors, buy them. I mean, I know people in California would love to purchase suppressors. I would love to be able to purchase suppressors. I've been kicking and screaming to work with various orgs. Uh, to get a lawsuit filed in California challenging the NFA restrictions. I know there's one up in Illinois right now challenging the state of Illinois' restrictions on suppressors, and that one is actually from Stephen Stambouli from GOA. I think he's doing that one on his own. Um, and I've talked to with him about maybe trying to do something here in California, but, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. That's a whole discussion within its own right, how some of these orgs decide what lawsuits they're going to they're gonna file, and I've you know, obviously I've worked with FBC and I've seen some of the inner workings about how some of those lawsuits are are selected and sometimes it, it baffles me. I know on the scale of things that people would be interested in, especially in California, if you ask them, hey, would you rather challenge maybe the one in 30 restriction or the NFA bans? I think most people would say, let's challenge the NFA bans because I can maybe deal now all these laws are unconstitutional. We should be challenging all of them, but sometimes we just don't have the resources, which then that's where that, that calculus happens of what, what lawsuits should we bring? Um, yeah. Suppressors are awesome. And uh, hopefully there's going to be some suppressor lawsuits coming soon for States like California. And I think, uh, you know, Anthony said that, you know, the, the cost involved. And I think that's something that people need to understand who are listening, who might be like, well, you know, why isn't, you know, GOA suing for this and why isn't SAF doing this? So I'm lucky enough to be working with these folks for so long that I, I get to talk to people like deeply involved in all of the processes. And like, if you get a case that goes to the Supreme Court, you're looking at a million, a million and a half at least for it to get just. There. Well, I mean, e e even just in the Supreme Court itself can get up to that depending Absolutely. on what happened. Yeah, and I was just saying, and then, um, and then when it's once the Supreme Court issues a cert, you're doubling the cost. So you're looking at three to $5 million for a, for a case, which is why they don't take up every case because they don't have that kind of loot. And if you're saying right now, listening to your car or watching this here on YouTube, why aren't they doing this? Call these groups offer to be a plaintiff. Oftentimes the, the thing, the wall they run into is they don't have enough good people who are willing to fight the fight in the courtroom. So if you want to help your state, call them. I can't guarantee they'll pick up uh, the case for you, but I know that they're looking for plaintiffs in several states. All the groups are. Uh, yeah. So be part of the fix. I keep saying, like in my YouTube channel, I've been saying for a couple of weeks now, like get involved. If you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, get involved. And that's one way you can. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we've learned over the last couple of years is that each of these organizations, and we talked about this about five episodes ago, each of these organizations have overlapping purposes and they don't all sue. They don't all go to the Supreme Court. They each have their own, I guess, their own goals or their own uh, things that they're 
pretty good at. And the GOA, I really, really love. I mean, there, there's a bunch of good ones, but they run lean. Their entire organization runs super lean, and they pump those dollars yeah. into the courtrooms. And I think it's good. I think it's valuable. And it's not that much to join. This is not a commercial at all. This is just something that the three of us live. How much is it to join GOA? Like 25 a year or something? A large pizza. A large pizza. Yeah. So I think it's absolutely worth it, and it's stinking expensive. It's a challenge. All right, we're going to play a game now called How Shocked Are You? It just found out an investigation by CBS News in Texas. They just found this out. Tell me if you're if you're shocked about this. Y'all know this, that there's nothing that police agencies enjoy more than is to, besides shooting dogs, is to confiscate firearms and a whole bunch, 15 different municipality law enforcement agencies They have contracted for the last five years, half a decade, contracted with this Louisiana company called Gunbusters Firearms Pulverizers. So this company is called Gunbusters. They're in Louisiana, 15 that we know of, 15 Texas law enforcement agencies. What they do is all of the guns that they they confiscate, thousands of them, they send them to Louisiana and this company for free. It's a free contract. They'll destroy these guns for free. Here's where it gets fun. Turns out they're only destroying the receivers, the receivers or the serialized piece. They strip every other part off these guns, the barrels, the triggers, the grips, the hand guards, and they sell them. So we have a private company profiting off of firearms taken from citizens. Anthony, how shocked are you? Not shocked. <laughs> Not shocked at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, coming from California, we've seen stuff like that happen a lot too with like law enforcement confiscating stuff. Um, and then we've seen that there is potentially some running to Mexico and selling to certain criminal organizations in other countries. So, I mean, stuff like that doesn't shock me at all. Um, Obviously, the second you said, hey, this is a free program, it's like, but wait, there's more because, <laughs> uh, yeah, doesn't doesn't shock me at all. Jared, um, you, you were in law enforcement for a long, long time. I know that different agencies have different policies of what they do with guns that were taking taken from criminals. Yeah, uh, it, it's more it's more of a state thing than it is an individual uh, municipality or agency. Uh, some states mandate that they have to be destroyed. Some states mandate that they have to be resold. Um, so it, it's different across the board, and it changes all too often for me to know what states do what. But uh, you know, shocking <laughs> that uh, that a, a company is is just doing the bare minimum. But you know, as a business mind, I also think way to think out of the box on that one. What they're doing, yeah. they're taking all these pieces and they're selling them as gun rebuild kits. So they're selling kits to people with everything except for the receiver. This all this whole story reminds me of a few years ago when Benchmade, Benchmade the knife company, they were they were helping out their local municipality and using their grinding equipment to destroy firearms that were uh, suspected or of whatever. And I think it's fascinating. The whole idea is fascinating where they're taking an inanimate object and grinding it up and then taking uh, pictures for social media to show that they're being social justice warriors and keeping the streets safe. And then guys reacted big. They ground up their own Benchmade knives. I've got a Benchmade knife and it was really expensive. I didn't grind mine up. Am I a big compromiser on the Second Amendment? No, no, uh, I did have one and I threw it away. But uh, Anthony's got one. If y'all can't see it, yeah, he literally have one in my pocket right now. We, we, there are so many companies that have made questionable moves across the spectrum of life, and if we just wrote off every company all the time, there'd be none left. I mean, that, well, let's just yeah, if we wrote off every company that's anti two way or against the type of politics and freedom we love, like we would not even be able to record the podcast that we're doing. You wouldn't be able to listen to this podcast because of Google. Um, I mean, it's just, you can't, now it's a little bit of a different story when you have a company that directly profits and is in the realm that we are in, especially when, and this, we've said this so many times on the podcast in multiple episodes, just because a company sells firearms or is a gun company or is pro firearms does not mean that they are pro 2 a or has shared the same ethos that we do. I mean, we've seen so many times that, um, Companies get caught up in scandals, helping with gun buybacks. 
I mean, what last year, the whole Liberty safe thing was, oh my gosh, that was a debacle. Now you got guys that are stickering over their Liberty safes or people aren't buying Liberty safes anymore. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's stuff like that happens all the time. Um, well, we eat and breathe this stuff, as I said a minute ago, and it's funny, like, like, we get on these high horses and we all do it. Our viewers do it. We get on these high horses. And if you remember when Daniel defense, like two years ago, it was like, you couldn't even mention Daniel defense without people just freaking out about what Marty Daniels said. Like, what was he supposed to say? He has a certificate from a, a government or organization that allows him to be in business. And then that organization said, should we eliminate ourselves? He's like, uh, not at this time. And people lost their minds. I get it. It's a nasty fight. I totally get it. But what I always have to remind myself is my phone, the thing that I use in both of these laptops, were made in communist China out of lithium mined by literal slaves and assembled by child laborers in a sweatshop. All that's verifiable. And so guys will get so upset if I have the wrong part or the wrong the wrong one little doohickey on my gun because that was made somewhere. And I get it. Like I try to do the right thing. I know Jared, you do as well. I try to buy from the right companies, but we'd run out of companies really quickly if we fought yeah. this giant fight against all of them. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, I try to do the right thing by the companies that stand by us. And I think that's more important than anything else is if there's a company that's, you know, dyed red, white, and blue right to this, right to the core, then those are the ones you send your money to, you know, even if it costs a couple extra dollars, like that's one thing you hear a lot is like, well, they cost too much money They're you know, they're $10 more expensive. All right, well, skip a large fry this week, you know, or two large fries and, and, and buy that and support that American company. That's, that's one way we need to start thinking is support those who support us. Yeah. Full disclosure, like one of my sponsors on my channel is CMMG. I love CMMG and I love CMMG long, long before they ever sponsor me. But I will say this, like all business aside, as a red-blooded, constitutional-loving American, those guys, they stand up for it. And they really like, like, like the ownership there. They really do fight the fight. Yeah, they just uh, they jumped in a lawsuit against, against the ATF and, uh, you know, Jeff Overstreet and his brother and the, and the, and the wives. Like, they're in this. Uh, they're putting their own money uh, to sue the ATF to try to, you know, save America, you know, to, to kick them back. Um, and they're fighting against the pistol brace ban, which is, a, you know, a big part of what CMMG was doing was pistol brace firearm. Yeah. Let's name some names, Anthony, some companies that you no company is perfect. None of them. They're all, we we're people, people are messy, but Anthony, what's some companies that you actually trust and that you look to? Oh man, there's so many. I mean, I literally have a sons of Liberty Gunworks. a blackout coffee is awesome, but I also have a, Sons of Liberty Gunworks rifle right next to me. Those guys are awesome. I know they had a strong relationship with Farms Policy Coalition. You know, they donate a lot to Farms Policy Coalition. That's sitting on an arrow lower. Arrow does awesome stuff. Any company that has a good PSA is awesome. I know there's a lot of debate about PSA, you know, what quality is. I know PSA does a lot for the community and they listen to the audience a lot. Uh, T-Rex Arms, I, I know even people have controversy about Lucas and T-Rex Arms. They share a lot of the same ethos that I do. Do I agree with everything that they do? No. Do they probably agree with everything I do? No, but I think they are focused on the community, arming civilians, arming the community, and they have a strong opinion on the Second Amendment that they will never compromise on. And uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's, there's so much. I mean, my whole office is, is gun stuff. So Eric, there's a, name some names. There's a lot. Uh, Gun Owners of America, Firearms Policy Coalition, Second Amendment Foundation, and the like, your state orgs that are actually doing the work rather than just existing to uh, recruit dollar bills. Um, you know, there are just, I mean, there's so many of them out there. We're going to name so many, and then some are going to be pissed because we left them off. Uh, but yeah. you know what we're talking about. You all have uh, the same beliefs that we do. We have overlapping beliefs. So, Support those that support you. You know, Johnny mentioned CMMG. I, I buy their stuff religiously, even before they were a sponsor. I'm getting channel. a new one next week. I'm, yeah, it's, it's coming me in. Too. Did we you too hear about that? that? Yeah, yes. it's coming in next week. I'm excited. Ooh, ooh. I'll, I'll give yeah. a clue. May the fourth be with you. May the fourth be with you as well, my friend. Yeah, it's it's really exciting. And what's crazy is this, these May the fourth guns are coming out. Uh, I don't know about your situation, but I'm buying mine. 
and Same. glad to glad to support these companies. And I think it's it's good to name some names sometimes because uh, we need to support those that are that are doing a, a good job. There's no perfect ones, and there's knuckleheads that work at every company. We get that. And speaking of knuckleheads, I think it's good to support guys and gals in the creator world uh, that that are that are getting things right. And we've gotten, you know, really, really good opportunities over the last several years to interview cool people. We had uh, uh, Brandon Herrera on here, potential congressman, Brandon Herrera on here several weeks ago. And it's just really, really cool. Nameless, one that I won't name, but last night I was hanging out with some friends and this guy brings up somebody in the creator community who is 100% a compromiser, does not believe that young people should own guns. And that it like only trained special warfare guys should be able to own guns. Yeah, the guy's name rhymes with Tim Kennedy. And he brought that guy up and, and I'm like, here's the deal. Like, like not everybody follows the constitution in the same way. And yeah, like, just like I said, sometimes we get too far into one direction. I have to stop and go, you know what? My car was made in Japan. I'm not all, you know, as American as I want to think I am. But on another level, we have to draw the line somewhere. And there are companies that I just cannot work with. And there's some people that I just cannot work with. Anthony, how hard is it in 2024 to draw that line because people are messy? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really hard. And I feel for the audience members, too, because you don't really know a lot of the behind the scenes. Like We are in a, a much different situation. Uh, I have a responsibility on my channel because the audience I have about who I work with and who I promote. Um, and I try to be very cognizant about that. If you've watched my channel, you know, I probably only, I only run about four sponsors any given year that I work with. And usually they're big sponsors. I do year long deals with them because I believe in them right now, blackout coffee, Jared and the awesome guys over there, because I know they believe in the same ethos that I do. Uh, first form, they're my supplement company. I use their supplements and I listened to Andy Versell and all of them way before. And I knew that they shared the same you know, again, ethos and and they believed in freedom. They're pro America. And so when they said, Hey, do you want to work with us? After they saw what I was already doing with them, I was all on board with that. Um, who else do I work with? Uh, Kershaw knives. I love Kershaw knives. I know people have mixed feelings about them, but I think they offer a premium product for <laughs> really low cost. And everybody has a Kershaw Walmart knife that they can just use as a beater. I love Kershaw. They, they invested in the channel in what I was trying to do on the channel really early on before it ever became anything that it was because they saw value in me trying to spread two-way information. Because you have to remember what me and Jared know this really well. Three years ago, when I started my channel, doing two-way news and content and legal breakdowns was not really a thing on YouTube, especially in the two-way space. It was all gun reviews, gear review, all of that stuff. There was not a lot of political talk. There was not channels that focused on two-way information. So when Kershaw saw what I was doing and they was like, hey, we love what you're doing, spread that, continue to spread that news. That's why I've worked with them. So yeah, it's it's hard. It's really hard to navigate that. We have a responsibility on our side. Um, you know, speaking about people like Tim Kennedy, we also have a different perspective because I have had multiple opportunities to meet him in person. I've met him quite a few times. Do I think he's a bad person? Absolutely not. I don't think he's a bad person. Uh, I might not agree with everything he says. I think he, I mean, I'll, I've gone on record. I think he's very misinformed about the Second Amendment. We have a, a mutual friend, John Lovell, who recently had him on his podcast to talk about his perspective of the Second Amendment. And Tim had the opportunity to maybe clarify his position. And I think he said some things that were even more detrimental than <laughs> what he said prior jared your eyes um, just rolled into the back of your head why because every time somebody gives uh, tim an opportunity to revisit that he just dives in further he goes further in the deep end uh, which i mean maybe that's i'm thinking obviously that is how he believes but you know i don't agree with his view on this the second amendment specifically when the age group that he thinks shouldn't have a gun is the age group that helped to fight to get our own independence. And it's the same age group that he was part of. And then we send them overseas. In fact, we're sending some over today to the Middle East because of Iran. Uh, so it just doesn't flow with actuality. It's a good talking uh, soundbite, I think. But uh, 
He's kind of like yeah. the Pete Rose, kind of like the Pete Rose of the gun industry. And like every time he opens his mouth, it gets worse. Like for decades, Pete Rose opens his mouth and it's like, ah, stop talking. And then Tim Kennedy's like, you know, red flags are really cool. And I'm going to help red flag laws get even stronger. And then other guys are like, uh, are you sure about that, Tim? And Tim's like, definitely. It just gets worse yeah. and worse and worse. I absolutely love it. I think it's fun. All right. Speaking of worse, I think this is bad. Y'all know that there's nonsense all over America, but in Rashid Khalib's Rashid Talib's own district, they were chanting death to America. Now, we're Americans and and the right to speak is really important. It really really is. But I also think the right to be able to say, you know what? Those are a bunch of morons and and somebody should slap them in the face. Rashid Talib refuses to condemn the death to America chance at a rally in her district. Jared, is it a problem? It is because she's a member of our government who was supposed to be America first. We all know she's not. She's part of the squad and she's refused to uh, to, to denounce Hamas. Uh, she's refused to, to denounce a lot of things that are anti-America. So, you know what? She needs to be replaced uh, Shame on her district if they don't vote her out and they still want to bitch about it. You guys got to get rid of her. Last week, there were chants in her district of death to America, death to Israel. Israel does not deserve to exist and celebrated the former Iranian Atola Khomeini. I don't know. Where does it end, Anthony? Like we've got actual Americans screaming in the streets, death to Israel and death to America. Does this end well? I don't know. It's it goes back to a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about in prior podcasts. Is I don't I don't know where we're going. Maybe it's an unprecedented time. I, I tried not to say that it's an unprecedented time because I think the narrative or the anti American narrative, it goes in cycles. I mean, we just had what fat electrician on the last podcast and he was talking about, you know, the post uh, Vietnam War war narrative that was going around and some of the academic narrative that goes around around right now and that's being perpetuated that's anti-America. I don't think that will ever completely go away. Um, it is definitely concerning with the current state of what we're dealing with on our own soil right now, going into election year, and then internationally what's going on right now. I mean, as we're filming this, I think what Iran has said that they are within the next 24 to 48 hours going to do a strike on Israel. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting times, very concerning. Uh, what the first presidential debate is supposed to happen or supposed to happen uh, in September. We'll see if that actually happens. It's September, right? It's some mid September. I think the first presidential debate is supposed to happen. Allegedly. Yeah. Allegedly. allegedly. Yeah. Hopefully his yeah. butt will have been wiped and he'll be able to come and uh, talk on camera. All right. This butt been wiped episode is brought to you by my friends at blackoutcoffee.com. You can save 20% off your first order with code Liberty and use the link blackoutcoffee.com slash Liberty. And with every order of their amazing coffee, you get to be a part of Operation Liberty. What the heck is that, Jared? So many of you know, I am one of the owners of Blackout Coffee. And if you go to our website, we have a thing called Operation Blackout. And you can go to the website and the top menu the middle one says support troops and what we do is we send coffee overseas so whenever you buy coffee we send two cups of coffee overseas if you buy a bag so you can go over to our website and there's two options you can if you have somebody overseas and deployed and you want to send coffee to their troop then you can select designated unit put it in there and we will try to get some coffee to that unit asap if you don't have somebody overseas but you still think that our troops are worthy of a hot cup of joe to get their day going uh, then you can also hit random unit and we will just, there's a bunch of uh, units overseas that request coffee. So we get a bunch of requests and we try to fill those. Uh, but blackoutcoffee.com slash Liberty. And we also have a new product. I'm stoked to tell everybody about instant coffee. Uh, it, it's, uh, I can't tell you the secrets behind it, but you can add it to some boiling hot water and it makes blackout coffee. And uh, it's phenomenal. You can bring it anywhere, hunting, hiking, kayaking, truck driving, if you're a troop overseas and they want to bring them and put them in their rucksack, you should send them some. Blackout. We need to get some of that for the expos. <laughs> What'd you say, Anthony? I said we need to get some of those for when we go to expos because there's a lot of times we go to expos and we really desperately need coffee because we've been up since two in the morning. Then we have like a show time at six to show up and 
we try to find coffee and either it's horrible or they don't have it. So we got to get some of yeah, that. I was thinking yesterday, it's been a while since we've been on a, had a good old fashioned road trip. I feel, I feel mm -hmm. one coming. All right. We have one coming. We got one ladies coming. And, ladies and gentlemen, we got a good one. Tennessee, the Senate has passed a term limits resolution. Uh, it hasn't gone all the way through, but they're trying to send this all the way to the tip top term limits. Uh, there's, there's, there's always these different opinions on it because you'll hear us see guys bang away in the comment section. All we need is term limits. Like people think it's going to be some sort of magic pill. Number one, on one hand, people are always saying if we just had term limits, you know, it would change everything. Number two, the other side is the founding fathers didn't do this for a reason. And then also they would just be just as criminal. They would just do it just as fast. Jared, do you think they'll ever go through? I hope so, but I doubt it. Uh, there no, and what Johnny's uh, referring to there, Tennessee is starting the process for a, a constitutional amendment to the United States Constitution for term, term limits. Uh, and I don't think you're never going to get. It's not going to be an easy one. If it goes through, it's going to be a long, hard knockdown, drag out slobber knocker, because uh, nobody in Congress is going to vote themselves out of a job, especially when you get uh, people like Nancy Pelosi who are. Uh, doing 280% better than the stock market. Uh, <laughs> there's a reason those old people squeeze in there and uh, become multi you know, millionaires when they make you know 170 a year. Yeah, but they're public servants. Anthony, would it be, if, if, if it did go through, which it's not going to go through, God bless Tennessee for at least trying this. If it did go through, would it be the magic bullet that so many, so many guys think it is? No, I don't, I don't think it would ever be the silver bullet. You got to remember, it's the same thing we say about gun control. Will a law solve the human condition? No, it's not going to solve the human condition. It's either just going to lead to some weird nepotism where you're just going to have a line of this person, then walking in this person after, the, you know, one after another. Or you're just going to have shorter term, more enhanced corruption rather than them sitting on their hands for 60 years. I mean they're just going to get their billions within the first four years or eight years or whatever it is that we, we set their limit to. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's going to be the silver bullet. Uh, you can't cure the human condition. If someone wants to do evil or they want this weird sense of power, they're going to get it. Or it's all it's going to lead to is they're going to serve their term in the house and then they're going to go into executive branches or go here or go here. And they're just going to, shift their corruption to different departments. Um, so, so you're I don't, suggesting I don't that criminals do criminal activities regardless yep. of their, the, the term of service of their public office. Yep. And don't think politicians can't be criminals. Don't think politicians can't be criminals. Hey, another good one coming out of Tennessee. Tennessee's two for two this week. The Tennessee Senate has banned local governments from enacting red flag laws. So the Tennessee and Nashville, the state Senate has passed a law that doesn't allow any municipalities or counties in the state from enacting any red flag laws. The red flag law is hot topic right now because people are dying over this stuff. It's, I mean, I've been on record for years since the red flag was kind of invented. Um, it's terrible. It's the biggest risk to our Second Amendment that we have. And uh, like you said, it has gotten people murdered by police over it. Um, it's not a good thing. Uh, the laws laws exist in every state to take somebody who's in a troubled space mentally and have them see professionals either with their consent or against their consent. Uh, and domestic violence laws already exist. So the only thing red flag laws do that those don't is to take your guns without a constitutional process. They just take them uh, through a civil process. It, it, they, red flags are terrible. And Tennessee's the, trying to do something that only, well, there are two states technically now. One that, uh, the first one was Oklahoma. Oklahoma in 2020, I believe it was 2020, uh, they passed an anti-red flag law. They can't, can't have one in, in Oklahoma. It won't be recognized. Uh, and then um, we've had a couple other states toy with it. We just had one state that passed one that uh, would, would not allow any would enforcement of a federal red flag. Well, we, we there isn't a red federal red flag law mainly because it's unconstitutional. Yet, yeah, yet, uh, yeah. and Tennessee's is you wouldn't be able to put one in a local area, which would basically say the only one that could be done is a federal one, which doesn't exist. So, 
we'll see what happens. But yeah, they're, they're no bueno. How is that bill structured? Because I haven't read that. How is it structured of, as far as the state, you know, restricting those localities? Is there implications as far as the state taking action against any officers or agents of a municipality who tries to do like how do they because a lot of these times these laws are structured very similar ways um especially like the second amendment preservation state laws that some of these states have passed they structure in a very specific i'm just curious because i haven't i haven't read that i've so i i breezed through this one and i didn't give it a lot of attention because we had a second amendment uh Protection Act that I thought was a shoe in but the Senate rhinos here in Tennessee killed that. Uh, so I'll send you a copy of it. I have to reread it myself to see if there's any teeth to it. But uh, when when I heard uh, the debate of why uh, the, the lady who did pitch it, what she was saying is like, you, you don't want places like Memphis to create something and Nashville to create something. It'll just confuse Tennessee uh, residents yeah. as well as police and, and uh, you know, uh, prosecutors and, and, and judges and stuff like that. So that's what she said when she said that that got to pass through this through the senate so yeah i'd be interested to see what that language is or you know, like you said if tennessee put any teeth on in it um against the municipalities but like johnny said uh, red flag laws are becoming more prevalent and they're becoming more of an issue and this goes back to something we talked about at the very beginning of this podcast why are red flag laws being discussed a lot more right now because the bipartisan safer communities act has federal incentives for states I think it's about $1.2 billion a year or something like that that goes towards incentivizing states to pass their own red flag laws and enforce them. And it gives money to those states. It also gives a lot of money to the states that already have them. Yeah. Um, and we've seen people what, like Matthew McConaughey come up with his own nonprofit to help facilitate. And, you know, it's totally just to facilitate. He's not trying to get in, in on any of those uh, federal grants that are out there to help enforce the red flag laws all right all right all right be a lot cooler if it didn't i know uh, the the bill here in tennessee i do remember it's saying that uh, it also barred any municipality from accepting that money whether or not they created a red flag or enforced a red flag so they are banned from accepting that money from the the bipartisan that's good yeah, and I think this this brings up the issue that we're dealing with right now, that it's across the board, things are escalating, and, you know, it's too easy to say, oh, it's getting crazy. It's always crazy out there. We know that. But Ammo Land had an article that came out just this morning, and this article's title is, Who Will the ATF Murder Next? Question mark. And it's a fantastic, a fantastic uh, uh, preposition. Who wrote that? Uh, Lee Williams. <laughs> and... The idea, the, the articles, who will the ATF murder next? Maybe, Anthony, that could be the title of this episode. The ATF, this is the first paragraph. The ATF went to Brian Malinowski's West Little Rock home last month, spoiling for a gunfight, and they got one. Now a good man is dead, the latest victim of the ATF's overly aggressive tactics and complete disregard for the sanctity of human life, close quote. Uh, the ATF has still not made a comment on that West Little Rock killing. I think it's a great article title. Who will they? Who will they murder next? As these, it feels like an anaconda tightening up on us. Every single ruling that comes out. We open this episode with these new rulings. I love to buy and sell in parking lots. This has implications for me. Everybody listening owns firearms. Probably, I would say nearly everybody owns them. And people trade and swap and they give to their uncles or they sell to their nephews. Who will the ATF murder next? Anthony, is the ATF in the murdering business? Uh, if it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck, it might be a duck. So that's all I'll say about the ATF so I don't get unalived here um, next and you know be in the headline of that article. But... Yeah, the ATF, so, and it's funny, that specific story plays directly into this stupid rule that they just passed. I mean, Jared, you did a whole uh, breakdown of a lot of the uh, the warrant that they got, and you can probably speak more to some of the factual situations of the buying and selling of firearms that triggered this activity against this individual. But that's exactly what we're dealing with here, what we're seeing here with this rule. And so when you ask me who might be next, or this article asks who might be next, probably someone who gets hit by this new rule similar to how that individual, because that's that's the type of conduct they're, they claim that they're trying to trigger or, or focus on here with this rule. And this rule with its presumptions about who's engaged in the business and who ATF might come to your door knocking, 
it could be someone who just bought a firearm and within 30 days sold it in the original packaging. And they say even just one incident of that, if they think you have the required intent, you can get hit by them. So, I mean, and Jared, you could probably talk more about the specifics about that, that situation because you did a whole breakdown of that um, and how it ties into this rule because, uh, yeah, things are getting interesting, very interesting. Yeah, so the, uh, the long and the short of it, if people want to see the whole breakdown, I've done a couple of videos on my channel, including like Anthony said, I had the warrant before anybody else, I think. Um, guys, he bought 150 guns in a very short period of time between like March 21 and February of 24. And then a lot of those were, were bought online in places like Gunbroker and the like. And many of those he flipped within 24 hours. Uh, which is a straw purchase. You know, he's, he's buying them, knowing him, he's, he's selling them. Now, I will preface that by saying he was buying things le legally. He was a nonviolent, non-prohibited person. And when you have something, you can sell it on your own. It's a piece of metal. And that's it. It's a piece of metal. And when you do sell something privately, all you need to hear from them is that they're not a prohibited person. So what he did is legal, but in the volume he did it and some of his clientele is what people are getting upset about. And the ATF, look, I was in law enforcement for 24 years. There were several ways they could have pulled off uh, obtaining him, the body, alive, and then searching the premises without anybody being injured. There is, for whatever reason, they chose not to do those. They chose to go in and kick the door in and, and, and put tape on his, uh, his ring camera. Um, they did it the way they did it for whatever reason. And then uh, he got into a shootout as soon as the door went crash. Uh, Malinowski was about 30 feet away. His wife wasn't too far from him. He started firing at what he, I'm assuming he thought were intruders at 6 a.m. Shot one ATF agent, uh, not seriously. And they shot him in the dome where he was you know, transported to the hospital and, and later passed. Yeah, it's it's the challenge for me. And, you know, I don't know. What do I know about tactics? Everything I know about police tactics, I learned from the movie Heat. But, you know, maybe crazy talk. How about just like, I don't know, like, like do a stakeout. Utah, give me two. Do a stakeout. And then like when the dude goes to lunch, like just walk up to him at the line at Burger King and say, hey, can we have a conversation? Or talk to him at work or stop him at the gym. Maybe don't break his freaking door down at six in the morning with a full SWAT team, like, like just talk to the guy. And yes, we all know that David Koresh from Waco was a weirdo. Like no, nobody's going to say he wasn't a weirdo. He's a cult leader. It kind of goes with the territory. Doesn't mean he deserved to burn to death with all those women and children. And by all reports, he ran every day at 10 30 AM, the same route. And they could have just, and, and he's, he's running in running shorts and shoes and they could have just stopped and gotten him. Yeah. Jared, what's with the strongman tactics? Why couldn't they just be sane and like just walk up and talk to the guy and have a conversation? Uh, they could have. That's that's the weird part. Uh, he was an airport executive at the uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton Airport in Little Rock. Uh, that's called irony, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Clinton National Airport. What did he know? Uh, mm -hmm. It's a, the, an airport's a sterile area, right? There's no no weapons. They could have just went into his office and then said, "Hey, man, we got a warrant for you." Uh, what's usually done uh, is he gets up in the morning because they had tracking devices on his car, uh, they pull him over a block from the house and effect an arrest that way. Bring him back to the house, do your search warrant. Uh, they could have done it a ton of different ways. They could have even like hey, knocked on the door and on a megaphone, hey, this is the FBI and ATF. Come out with your hands up. Uh, we have a warrant. There's a bunch of different ways uh, they could have done it. Uh, they chose uh, to go in uh, with force at 6 a.m. and it ultimately cost a life. Is this just overly testosterone dudes who got nothing else to do that finally get to put their big boots on and go serve a warrant? I mean, it, it, it's You're talking about the ATF. Yeah. I don't think any of those guys all serving as ATF agents have testosterone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> man, th th and I'm sorry if I insulted you if you're an ATF federal agent, but you know what you're doing. That is that is an insult to all guys with low testosterone. <laughs> <laughs> there's a whole bunch of ways they could have done it. And there's a lot of things that go into why, uh, you know, command makes the decision they do. And I wasn't privy to those. 
but I do know there were a ton of different ways that could have affected that uh, that search warrant. Well, it's unfortunate loss of life. I think it's avoidable. I was thinking today about Duncan Limp. A lot of folks don't know that story, but it's a, a young man that was shot by his local police department in Maryland through the wall of his house while he was asleep in bed, laying in bed next to his pregnant girlfriend. They just shoot him and nobody ever answered to that. I know that these cases are outliers. Well, maybe not with the ATF because they're a, they're a bunch of low testosterone um, fill in the blanks according to Anthony, the armed scholar. But I think one of the challenges is there are outlying situations that could have been avoided. And like, like there's so many of even the big cases like Ruby Ridge, I think that could have been super avoided, like big time. And Waco absolutely avoided for us. How do we move forward? Because it kind of gets scary. We have these conversations. We were at a campfire back in the fall talking with a, a mutual friend and and this individual is talking about, I'll never be served papers. I will die in my driveway. For those of us that think through, like, what do we do if there's ever a knock on the door? Both of you, any advice? If there's ever a knock on the door by people with windbreakers and the badge hanging around their neck, advice? Uh, don't answer questions. Call an attorney. If you don't have an attorney, there are a bunch of organizations that you can join uh, or just make a phone call and put one on a retainer for 500 bucks. Uh, don't look, I, I, I was a cop for a long time. They're not coming to your house and asking you questions to build a friendship. They don't want to be pen pals. They're building a case against you. So shut up. You have a, you have a right to remain silent, exercise that right. Tell them to talk to your attorney. Anthony, if they come knocking on your door, are you going down in a blaze of glory? What are you doing? No, I mean, I'm not going down in a blaze of glory. I still have trust, I guess, as naive as it may be in the judicial system. Uh, but Jared's absolutely right. I mean, take it from an attorney. Don't talk to the police. Uh, do not give them permission to enter your house. If they have, if they don't have a warrant, tell them to go pound sand. Um, call your attorney. Yeah, it might be a good idea if you think you're at a high risk. I mean, there's a lot of situations right now where some people might think that they're at high risk because... They own certain items that the ATF is all of a sudden think, you know, is prohibited. So maybe it's a good idea to just have something in your back pocket. But yeah, don't talk to the police. Call your attorney. Do not give permission to any law enforcement to enter your house. If they have a warrant, then they can do what they're going to do, you know, based on the restrictions of the warrant. Uh, it's probably also a good idea to talk with your significant other or spouses or whoever, um, and also tell them the same, never let law enforcement into your home unless they have a warrant, never give them permission because we've seen plenty of situations where a significant other will let law enforcement into the home. I mean, I tell my wife all the time too, cause I travel a lot. I tell her if someone, if law enforcement, Cal DOJ or someone comes knocking on our door, unless they have a warrant, tell them to go pound sand. Don't let them in the house. So, um, yeah, I mean, just uh, it's it's unfortunate and it's also unfortunate that I even have to have those thoughts or conversations. And we have a lot of friends who have those thoughts and conversations just because we're here on a platform talking about the Second Amendment, talking about firearms and pro-freedom. We have to worry about what would happen one day if all of a sudden a federal agent decides they don't like us and want to come knock on our door. And we've had friends. I mean, I don't I wasn't at that conversation you guys had, but. I know we were all sitting <laughs> at a table and one of our friends who's a YouTuber was talking about the strategies that he has set up with certain belt feds and then <laughs> set up at certain choke points in his home yep. and, you know, to each their own, you know, to each their own. That's not what I have set up. Uh, but, you know, that's a reality, too. Some people do not trust the government and rightfully so when you see the ATF do things like they're doing. I just think it's big for people to understand what our rights are and to know them and exercise them. That's why we have them. People died to make sure you have the right to remain silent. Uh, people died for for the warrants to be a thing. Uh, so yeah, make don't make the cops who are there to screw you. Don't make their job easier because uh, often they're just on fishing expeditions hoping to find something. Yeah. In this episode, we called out the ATF. We named brands by name, which was kind of fun. We also learned that Tim Kennedy may or may not love the Constitution of the United States. And we learned that if they show up at your door, keep your mouth shut, get yourself an attorney on retainer, and call yourself a lawyer. We call it the Liberty Lounge. 
However you found us, we're glad you did. Wave it out, fellas. We'll see you next time.